I'd like to welcome everybody. This is the first in a series of public lectures that are sponsored by the University of Washington Molecular Medicine Training Program. And this is a program that was designed to capitalize on the recent interest and success and progress in research at the interface of basic science and medicine and bring elements of medical training to our PhD students. And it's a broad-based and very interdisciplinary program. It represents a collaboration and a cooperation between the departments of medicine and the eight basic science graduate departments at the medical school, including biochemistry and bioengineering, genome sciences, immunology, microbiology, pathology, pharmacology, and physiology and biophysics. And we've been really lucky to obtain support for H from HHMI for our training program and for efforts like this public lecture that are designed to make the public and the university community and the broader community aware of the excitement in this field. So as our first lecturer in this series, we're really, really lucky to have Evan Eichler, who is an investigator at HHMI and an associate professor of genome sciences here. And Evan's work has really given us new and wonderful insights into the human genome, and in particular into sort of some of the hidden and secret and fascinating places where the genome is most actively undergoing changes, as you'll hear. And Evan will be talking about the changing human genome and its implication for disease and evolution. So Evan, thank you. Here we go. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you for uh, organizing this lecture series. Uh, it looks to be a very interesting lecture series, and I, I look forward to the other talks after, after this one. I want to talk to you today about some of the work that we've done um, and some of the work that we did as part of the Human Genome Project uh, in over the last 10 years in terms of understanding the organization of our genome and its potential importance in terms of understanding both disease and as well as evolution of our species. So what is a human genome? Uh, the human genome, just like any genome, is a complete set of instructions which dictates essentially that we will be human beings. What distinguishes a bat from a banana from a human is all encoded in its DNA code. Each of the 50 trillion cells that make up your body essentially have, for, for more or less, the same genetic blueprint encoded in each one of them. And so shown here is a picture of a cell. In, indicated in the center of it is where the, the DNA is kept. It's packaged within chromosomes. And those chromosomes express genes, and those genes dictate which, which proteins are produced in specific cells, and how, they, how those, those proteins are produced will dictate how an organism is formed during development. So these instructions dictate when and where cells are formed and how they are organized to form your body. As I mentioned, the human genetic material is packaged into chromosomes. In the case of human, we're made up of 24 different chromosomes. There are actually 23 pairs, 22 which we call autosomes, which are not sex chromosomes, and the X and the Y, which distinguish males and females. Each person receives one set of chromosomes from each of their parents, and each chromosome contains roughly about 1,000 genes. So it's thought now that the human genome is made up of about 20,000 genes, not much different from um, the, uh, a fruit fly or a worm, kind of a disappointing aspect of sequencing the human genome. We thought we would have a lot more <laughs> genes and after, the, after many years of looking, uh, we come up with this number of roughly 20,000. So shown here is a, kind of a, an ideogram or a, a representation of how we think about chromosomes, at least from a cytogenetics perspective. This is the idealized version of one chromosome, the X chromosome, and here's an actual electron micrograph showing a, a fluffy, more fluffy protonaceous structure representing the X chromosome. This is actually a fragile X chromosome uh, indicated here by this, this, this constriction. So I want to digress a little bit. This, this is actually a fairly central component of understanding genetics, and this is this idea of recombination. So each of us that are sitting here uh, arose from a sperm and an egg, and that sperm and the egg carried essentially one 
a half of a complement of our, each of our parents. And essential in this process of, of, of making the egg and making uh, the sperm is what we call recombination. So for those of you who remember um, biology from uh, probably grade 12 or perhaps even uh, in undergraduate, a central component of this process is essentially the aligning of chromosomes during meiosis. So meiosis is that stage in which you actually get that reduction in, in terms of the complement uh, from, your, from your parental types down to a single, uh, single representation. So shown here are f four cr chromosomes, one set coming from, f from dad, one set coming from mom. And essential to this is essentially a recombination event in which there's a crossover that occurs between the mother's and the father's chromosome and, and such producing gametes, and I'm just showing you now two, this could be an egg or a sperm, where you actually have part of your paternal and part of your maternal chromosome now represented in each of these. So this goes to form an egg, which infuses with a sperm, which then goes to make a living organism. And the important point here is that every sperm and egg that you generate is essentially made up of a composite of those paternal, both mom and dad's chromosomes um, that go to actually form an offspring. So this is an important process because I'm going to tell you later on how this goes awry and how we use this information to essentially identify regions of the genome that we think are associated with disease. So about uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I guess, uh, the Genome Project was initiated, I guess, and picked up full steam. And it was an international consortium which determined the order of the basic base pairs that constitute the human genetic sequence. So the genetic sequence of any organism is made up of really just four base pairs, an adenine, a thymine, a cytidine, and a guanine. And the task that was set in front of about 5,000 scientists across the world was to determine the order of every base on every chromosome in about a span of about 10 years. So they were ext extremely successful, and I'm, I was pleased to be part of it in a very small way of that effort. And in 2001, a working draft assembly of that genome was presented to the world. I think some of you probably saw some of that fanfare uh, with uh, uh, presidents and a number of other people uh, kind of uh, celebrating that event. And in 2005, they published it yet again, getting it more or less uh, better in terms of its organization, in terms of its sequence. And an important point to remember is that that initial genome was not based on a single individual. That sequence was generated really from a composite of individuals. But for any given stretch of that sequence, one person's genome sequence is represented. So the sequence that most scientists now use, particularly geneticists, is not essentially based on any one individual, but really based on a composite of, a composite of individuals. So here's an example of one page of text from the human genome. So it's, as I mentioned, it's made up of these uh, adenine, thymine, cytidine, and guanines. A fairly boring read uh, for most people. Um, uh, it's essentially many, many pages of this. And in fact, if this is one page of the blueprint of human life, uh, and one page equals 300 characters, one chapter would equal 50 pages. The genome, the book of life, would be essentially 20 chapters at about a million pages. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of that, see, of that, of that undertaking. So a lot of what's gone on in, since the human genome has been sequenced is to provide annotation to this sequence, to, to describe where the genes begin and end, to describe the functional bits that make up our genetic code. And in fact, uh, the vast majority of that sequence is thought not to have function at present. And that may be a reflection of our ignorance, but it also may in fact be true. Uh, people now believe that roughly about 5% of that sequence is the functional bit that encodes proteins and encodes the regulation. So this brings us to why the genome was sequenced to begin with. And the whole point of sequencing a human genome was to understand the human condition better. And much, much of the National Institutes uh, uh, of Health research is focused on understanding disease. So the idea behind sequencing the human genome is that by using and by having this blueprint that we'd be able to get the understanding of the molecular basis of disease much more quickly by having one representation of that human genetic sequence in front of us. And there's the realization that no matter what the disease, that almost every disease that we can think of has at least some genetic component, either direct or indirect. And in terms of the genetic components, in some cases, the disease and the genetic component with respect to the environmental influence on a disease 
uh, is pretty profound. So in a disease like cystic fibrosis, it's not a question of whether you will develop the disease irrespective of your environmental circumstance, but if you actually have the point mutations, the mutations that cause cystic fibrosis, you will develop the disease, and environment will only contribute to how severe the disease and when the disease may manifest. In other diseases, and this is really represented more as a kind of a black box at this point, we know there's an inherited or there's a genetic component to the disease, but in cases such as diabetes, autism, and mental retardation, we really don't know the represent, really the genetic factors that contribute to the disease in most cases. So the vast majority of diseases where we believe there's a genetic component and a strong genetic component, we have yet to identify what that genetic component is. And that is essentially the punchline for the genome project. The genome sequence was supposed to be presented to biomedical researchers for this purpose, is to get at the genetic causes of diseases both rare diseases as well as common diseases, diseases that afflict every one of us at some level uh, in this audience. So after the sequencing of the human genome, really the next phase was understanding variation in this room. So the idea being that if we understood where the genetic variants are that distinguish people and distinguish individuals with and without disease, we may be able to identify the genetic factors that predispose someone to diabetes, someone to autism, someone to mental retardation. So a lot of energy was focused and, and funneled into actually cataloging all the genetic variation that exists in the human species. And so it's important to realize that genetic variation comes in many flavors and forms, but much of the initial effort was pointed at trying to find the single base pair differences that distinguish one individual from another. And so most humans and most humans genetic code is virtually identical. 99.9% .9 identical. And so what people have been trying to do and quite successfully have achieved this is try to find those single base pair differences as an example shown here in red that would distinguish one genetic sequence from another. So it turns out that even though it's fairly, fairly small, there are a lot of needles in these haystacks. And so in, in any two individuals, there'll be at least uh, about two and a half to three million single nucleotide variations. But this isn't the only form of variation that exists within the human sequence. We know that in that textbook of the human sequence, there are occasionally parts of the sequence and the part of that text which is missing, deletions. And sometimes these deletions can be small, and sometimes they can be very large, involving many, many pages of text in, in the human genetic code. And there also can be duplications. So this is actually relatively hard to see, but if you, could, if you have a really good eye, you'll see that this sequence is represented again. It's kind of uh, essentially a burp in the, in the genetic code, in which we have the same sequence here represented now twice. So some individuals have this sequence, additional sequence, and some don't. And it's only been recently, probably in the last three or four years, um, that we've been able to develop the tools and the technologies to go after these not single base pair changes. So these events that are larger than a, a base pair change um, and between different individuals. So what I want to talk to you today about then is our efforts to use the human genome sequence to go after these big or bigger scale events uh, in, in our population. And I want to show you examples of how we were able to find these using both specific technologies and a, spe and a specific paradigm and how we've been able to essentially uh, identify and link these to genetic diseases. Diseases in which we didn't know the genetic cause uh, uh, even a year ago. So our lab specifically focuses on studying the genome architecture and organization. So while many people are studying genetic differences and looking at their transmission through pedigrees or through families, we study the organization of the human genome specifically. And we have been focused on really identifying regions that change very, very rapidly over evolutionary time. So by comparing the sequences of different organisms closely related to human, such as the chimpanzee, or the orangutan, or the macaque, we've been trying to find those areas of the genome that change much more rapidly than anywhere else. And the idea is fairly straightforward. If they're changing very rapidly during the course of evolution, it's possible that they're changing very rapidly right now in us. And if they're changing very rapidly, maybe sometimes they're beneficial, and maybe sometimes they result in disease. And so we've been assessing these regions particularly for their disease impact, and specifically focusing on their role in mental retardation, autism, and epilepsy. 
And I want to try to show you some examples of these uh, through the course of the lecture. So one specific type of sequence that we've been very interested in uh, from the, pretty much for the last 10 years are duplicated sequences. So this is a representation of a chromosome. And a duplicated sequence is simply a piece of sequence that exists more than once in the genetic code. So these are historical events in which you have a block of sequence represented once, twice, three times throughout. And they come in two flavors. Those that are duplicated within a chromosome, we call intrachromosomal duplications. And those that are duplicated between chromosomes, we call interchromosomal duplications. So why do we care about these sequences? So if you remember that slide I showed you about normal recombination, kind of the, the, kind of the key point in terms of, of, of a crossover or a recombination event that goes to produce gametes such as sperm and egg is aligning chromosomes during meiosis. And the way that paternal and maternal chromosomes align is by using sequence identity to help find this, the, the similar, similar chromosome between mom and dad when gametes are being produced. So when you have duplicated sequences within a genome, what can happen is you can actually trick the recombination machinery. So instead of a, 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 a crossover occurring between homologous chromosomes, what can happen is that these chromosomes can misalign. So now I'm just showing you two chromosomes during meiosis. And instead of them aligning as they should have aligned, kind of zippering up in perfect register with one another, because of this duplicated sequence shown in green, they misalign. And so a crossover event occurs here. And when, it, when a crossover event occurs when it's misaligned, we create additional copies of sequence and we delete copies of sequences. So if we follow this line, essentially this crossover event, you'll see in this particular case that we start here, we go over to this posi position, and we come back down and go over here. We create a gamete, either an egg or a sperm, which has additional copies of that duplicated sequence. If we go the other direction, start over here, go up, we create a gamete that has only one copy of that duplicated sequence. So the really important part, and this is something that actually distinguishes our genome from many others, is that if these duplicated sequences are not tandem, but are interspersed, that is to say they're separated by large distances, everything that lives between these two duplicated sequences gets taken along for the ride. So in addition to having copies of additional copies of that green duplicated sequence, or losing copies of that duplicated sequence. We have also duplicated the genes that live BC between these two du duplicated blocks. So in this particular case, we have genes A, B, and C. And in this particular gamete, we now have additional copies of genes A, B, and C. And in this particular gamete, we have lost copies of genes A, B, and C. So in the formation of our body, Having genes expressed at the right amount and at the right time is critical. If this is perturbed, the result can be disease. And there are, and there have been, over the last 20 years, many diseases in the human species that have been identified precisely by this mechanism. Essentially, where you have an increase or loss of a piece of sequence, leading to an increase or a decrease in expression of a specific gene, which then results during development in problems. So if you stop and you think about this, this is a little bit different from the normal genetic paradigm. Most people think about inherited disease. They think about transmission of, an, of a mutant from a mother or a grandfather through down to the offspring. This is something that happens in everybody's germline. So as all of us sit here and we're producing sperm and egg, these events are happening at specific regions of the genome. And so specific regions are deleting and duplicating because of the architecture. And it's not that your mom had it or your dad had it, it's that your architecture and your genome dictates that these events will happen. So if you understand this, you've pretty much got the rest of the lecture cased. <laughs> so it's, it's the key component. So just some examples of diseases that are caused precisely by this mechanism. You probably haven't heard of many of these unless you have somebody in your family with the disease. Um, they have very long titles such as Velocardiofacial de George syndrome, this is a disease that occurs once every 2,000 births. Children have a variety of, of, of physical manifestations, but the most common uh, observation is essentially defect in heart development. So these are kids that are identified fairly early in life 
with usually some, some defect in the way their heart is, is developed or formed, specifically the septum um, um, uh, in, in the developing heart. Another disease, prader willi angelman syndrome, occurs about, each of these occur at about 1 out of 15,000 births. This is a, a, a recurrent deletion of a region on chromosome 15, where children have essentially mild uh, to severe mental retardation and some very characteristic physical features. Williams syndrome, also known uh, as the elf-like syndrome. The children actually look, they have appearances, pointy ears. Um, they have mental retardation, mild mental retardation, but very specific uh, facial features that are associated with a recurrent deletion on chromosome 7. And there are an additional 20 uh, syndromes that when we started doing this work were, had, were already identified at this time. So the two important points about these types of diseases, I think I've already mentioned one. First, they're not inherited. They're occurring in your, in your gametes, in your sperm, in your egg, all, every time you produce them. And so they're not the classic genetic disease that people think about that are transmitted. And second, if you look at where these deletions or duplications begin and end, they all, all, all the examples that I'm citing up here begin and end within duplicated sequences within our genome. Areas of the genome that have been duplicated historically over the last few million years of human evolution. So our experimental design was fairly straightforward. If we could develop ways to identify these duplicated sequences within the human genome, we could use this essentially as a predictor of where to look for these types of events. Spontaneous deletions or duplications of sequence within children in which the genetic diagnosis has not been identified. Of course, what we needed first is we needed a good reference sequence, the human genome. We needed to have an assay, an experimental assay that would allow us to detect gains and losses once we identified these regions. And we needed to actually have a good set of kids or diseased individuals to go after. And so we want to assess initially as well normal individuals in the population to identify regions that were different within normal individuals so we wouldn't be fooled by them when we went after kids with disease. So this is a complicated map of the human genome. But this basically shows it in all of its duplication glory, or for the most part. So each line here represents a chromosome. So the human genome, as I mentioned, has essentially 24 chromosomes, the X and the Y being the sex chromosomes. And every green li uh, blue line that you see on this map represents a duplicated sequence, a very large and highly identical sequence that exists somewhere else in the genome. And so if you go along the chromosomes, you'll see some chromosomes, such as chromosome 7, Chromosomes 16, 15, 17 are particularly enrich, enriched in these duplicated sequences. <coughs> Everything with a gold bar underneath it represents a region of the genome that we think, based on its organization, its architecture, would be predisposed to delete or duplicate. So these are the regions that we would predict to be associated with disease. And if you look very carefully, anything with a letter underneath it, indicated here A, B, and so on, represent regions that we already knew at the time when we started this study were associated with genetic diseases. So there are about 130 regions of our genome that are particularly plastic. They change very, very rapidly or potentially could change very rapidly over very short periods of time, including the gains and losses of sequence as gametes are being produced. And so the idea was to target these specific regions in disease patients. So this is the one technology that we used. The technology is array comparative genomic hybridization, and it's fairly straightforward. But essentially, this represents a blown up view of a piece of a slide. This is 12 millimeters across. And each dot that you see on here represents a DNA molecule that has been fixed to that slide. So we know exactly where that DNA molecule came from in the human genome. And so what this represents then is, a, is an array of DNA molecules corresponding to those sites that we believe to be unstable in the human genome. And so this experiment entails essentially labeling two DNA samples with two different colors. So we label one DNA sample with a red probe. And we label another DNA sample, let's say a diseased individual, with another probe. And then we take those two DNA samples and we hybridize them back to the original slide. 
So what hybridization is, it's a process by which DNA molecules find similar looking DNA molecules on a slide or in a solution. And if any DNA sample that is labeled in red and any DNA sample that's labeled in green are of equal quantity, they will hybridize with the same intensity to that spot. So for example, if the red sample and the, and the green sample were hybridized to a specific spot in this, on this array, this would appear as essentially a yellow dot, saying there's equal amounts of yellow and green, which we manifest as yellow. If, for example, in this diseased individual, there was more of a specific piece of DNA, when hybridized back to this array, it would look more intense with respect to the normal individual. And so this would hybridize and be detected as an increase of signal intensity in the green channel. If this individual essentially was missing some sequence corresponding to a specific site in the human genome, and you hybridized it competitively with a normal DNA sample, you would see more red at that specific spot, indicating a deletion of that specific region on the genome. So if you look very carefully at this slide, you'll see that most of the spots are essentially yellow or black, meaning that it didn't hybridize at all. So there's a problem in the experiment at that specific spot. But you will see some areas that look like they're green, indicating an increase of DNA with respect to the disease sample, and some areas which look red, indicating a potential deletion with respect to the disease sample. So this is the technology that we use. It's called Array Comparative Genomic Hybridization. It's pretty clear from this that in order to do this technology, or to do this approach, you would have to actually have a, a human genetic sequence to begin with. So having the whole human genome sequence in front of us allowed us to build these specific slides to, for ex experimental testing. So here's an actual example, a very simple example, where we're actually taking DNA molecules across a chromosome. So this is one of those regions that we would consider to be a hot spot or a susceptible region to deletion or duplication. So here are the duplicated sequences shown here in green. And we have probes 1 through 20 indicated here on the, the x-axis. And so each of these panels represents an independent experiment. So what we're doing is we're comparing one DNA sample against a normal DNA sample for each one of these three experiments. So in the top panel, and I should point out that we already knew the answer when we, did, we first started these experiments, so these are, ex these are events that we knew were causing disease in specific patients. The top panel represents a child with autism whose DNA has been isolated, and we know that this, this patient actually has a duplication of a specific region of this specific region between probes 6 through uh, 15. And so the way we measure this is we look at the signal intensity differences between these two colors, the green and the red, and we measure it as a log 2 relative hybridization intensity signal. So the important point here is that if you, if you see the log 2 relative hybridization intensity being essentially zero, that means there's equal proportions of the red and the yellow signal. So log 2 of one is zero. So this particular individual here, most of the probes are essentially log two equals zero. In this particular example up here, this is the patient with autism. We knew that this patient had a duplication of this particular region. You see an increase in signal intensity in, in the green channel, so a log two relative hybridization intensity of greater than zero. This represents a patient which has Prader-Willi syndrome. It's the reciprocal event. So instead of having the duplication, it actually has the deletion. And here we see a decrease in, that, in signal intensity, indicating a deletion of this region between probes 6 and 15. So this is the approach. We're looking for gains and losses of signal intensity with respect to a reference DNA sample as indicative of gains and losses of DNA corresponding to specific regions of the human genome. So these are the target regions of the genome that we looked at. Duplicated regions, large blocks of duplications, highly identical, in which there is intervening sequence in between, so unique sequence in between. And we're looking to find these types of events. So if you remember that, that the diagram I showed you before, this would be a deletion event of that intervening sequence. This would be a duplication event of that intervening sequence. So what patients should we look at? 
So if we went back to the literature and looked at the known diseases at the time when we started this study that were associated with spontaneous deletions and duplications of regions of the genome flanked by duplicated sequences, what we would find is that the vast majority had a neurologic component. So the vast majority of kids that are born as a result of these types of microdeletion and microduplication events either have a mild to moderate mental retardation and or severe congenital abnormalities. So there's defects in the way their heart develops, the way their kidneys develop, or some other incredibly important aspect of, 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 of human development. The other important point is that effectively, in terms of mental retardation, the vast majority of children that are thought to have a genetic basis for mental retardation, there's no genetic diagnosis for them. So what typically happens when a child is born and doesn't pass developmental milestones, it goes in for testing, its chromosomes are examined, most of the time those come back normal. A child is tested obviously for things like Down syndrome, a child is tested for Fragile X syndrome, and a few other tests, but in the vast majority of cases it comes back with no explanation or unexplained mental retardation. And so, based on these two observations, we went after specifically children with undiagnosed mental retardation. Children that had been tested in clinical centers, in molecular genetic centers, and they had come back after testing of not having any, any of the obvious genetic causes of mental retardation. And our hypothesis was that if we examine these specific regions for gains and losses in these children, we would find examples of new syndromes, of new diseases, caused by this spontaneous deletion around duplicated sequences of the genome. So I want to share with you then some data based on the analysis of some study populations. As I mentioned before, the first thing that we did is we looked at normal individuals, quote unquote normal. And I hope to convince you by the end of this talk that none of us here are actually normal in terms of our genome, so don't feel too secure about that. Um, we analyzed 316 individuals uh, from a collection which uh, uh, individuals had signed informed consent. We know very little about these individuals other than the fact they don't have any obvious diseases. And when we analyzed those individuals for these specific regions, we created a catalog of normal variation, what we considered normal variation, copy number changes. So we use that as our benchmark to compare when we see events in kids with disease, did we see it in a normal set of individuals? And if we did, we typically would then skip over that because it's already been identified in the normal set. We then focused on children with unexplained mental retardation. We analyzed uh, about 500 individuals that were negative for common genetic causes of mental retardation. We had the good fortune of working with a group from Oxford, Jonathan Flint, which had 20, 291 unrelated children. And when I was back in Cleveland, we gathered uh, uh, information and data on about another 164 unrelated children with mental retardation that had been tested and had come back negative. And so what we're specifically looking for then is if everything works well, we should be able to find events that are found in the children but not seen in the normal individuals. <clears throat> and if we're really lucky, we should be able to find in a collection of children with mental retardation multiple events, the same event seen multiple times in unrelated families. <clears throat> so here's again a, an ugly log two hybridization plot. But we're showing it now just for four children across one region on chromosome 17. And the only thing I want you to get from this is, is essentially each of these represent the hotspot regions across that, that region of the chromosome. But you'll notice that one area stands out. A region right here, which corresponds to this position on the chromosome, a small region of about a half a million base pairs that we identified in four children with mental retardation, but we had never observed once in a, a roughly at that time about 300 normals that had been studied. So this would be a good candidate but it's certainly not a proof that we've discovered anything related to mental retardation. It's just something that we saw in multiple children with mental retardation. So I think it's important to think about what is the burden of proof that we've identified a disease. So if everything is, is as I said it would be, we should see multiple unrelated individuals with identical breakpoints. Those breakpoints should map to duplicated sequences in the genome, and it shouldn't really much extend beyond that. Kind of a litmus test is when you compare parents to the children, we should see that the parents, which do not have mental retardation, should not show the deletion or the duplication of sequence, while the child does. So we're looking for a spontaneous event. And if we gather a large enough number of children, we would hope to see similarities in the clinical 
manifestation. So in other words, there should be similarities in the way these children look and the types of diseases and the, and the, that they develop. So that's the burden of proof that we wanted to apply to the regions that we would find in these children. And so I'll take you on a few examples of this. So this is one of those four children on chromosome 17. And now what we're doing here is the same experiment as log 2 relative hybridization from array, array comparative genomic hybridization experiment. But instead of actually having just a few probes, what we've done is we've, we've essentially carpet bombed the entire region with about 11,000 oligonucleotides. So these are smaller probes representing much more refinement across the entire region. So this is the child at the bottom. And you can clearly see this depression over here indicating that there's something different about this child with respect to mom and dad. So over this specific region of the genetic code, this is about, about, a, a, about a million base pairs of sequence that we're looking at, at least in this representation, we clearly see that there's a deletion here that's not seen in either mom or dad. So this passes one of the tests. It would be a spontaneous event in the child and not seen in, in either of the parents. So just to orientate yourself, these are the duplicated sequences at the flanks. So the second part is that the breakpoint should roughly map around the duplicated sequences. You clearly see that the breakpoint, at least the extent of this, goes into this duplicated sequences. Here it may stop a little bit sh shy of the duplicated sequence, but if you look, you'll also see that beyond this critical region is essentially a region of the genome that we know as copy number variant in normal individuals. So it makes it difficult to map the breakpoint precisely the extent of this deletion, because mother actually has part of this sequence over here deleted, while dad doesn't appear to have the same amount, but has a portion of it deleted. So this would be a normal region of copy number variation, and this would be the critical region that we believe to be associated with disease. So I won't go into the different genes that are in this region other than to mention one. There are five genes that can be mapped specifically in this region, and perhaps the most interesting candidate is a gene known as MAP-T, also called Tau. This is a gene in which point mutations have been found in association with Parkinsonism and frontal temporal dementia. So we're currently pursuing this gene, as well as the other five genes, to actually pinpoint which of these five genes actually may be the cause of the disease. But the data would suggest that when this region is represented only once, as opposed to twice, as it should be in the genome, that the result would be a mental retardation. So what do the other patients look like? So to make a long story short, there are the other patients. And you can see that their breakpoints appear to be roughly identical, mapping at least around the regions of these duplicated sequences. So that was like, I think, number three in our burden of proof. And in our collection of 291 kids, there were four patients that we identified. And if this is true, and this does cause mental retardation, this would account for about 1.4% of mental retardation, at least in this, in this group that we looked at. So what do the patients look like? So here are two of the patients with the disease. And these, I should emphasize, are unrelated patients. You can see a couple of common features. In addition to having mental retardation or mental handicap, they actually have a very pronounced, actually bulbous nose, which is actually seen in many of the patients that have been identified to date. They have a very pronounced philtrum. And if you look at a larger suite of patients, and this is what was some work that we've done more recently with our former competitors and now colleagues um, in, uh, in Europe, you'll see similarities in the, in the phenotype once again. You'll see, in addition to the bulbous nose, you'll see that many of the children have a protruding tongue. And in fact, in many of the patients that have been identified, they are fairly fair-skinned, uh, even when the parents are not, and they have blonde hair and blue eyes, uh, which is an interesting observation. But the real litmus test at the end of the day when we found, and to date we find identified roughly about 20 children with this disease, is actually sending these photos back to a clinician and saying, these are the, these are the way these children look. Can you find us additional examples of these children? And in a collection of 10 children that were recently sent back to our lab, three of them actually had the disease. So we take this as good evidence that we've actually identified a new genetic syndrome caused by spontaneous deletion and duplication of this region. So the story doesn't end there. It's a little bit of a wrinkle to it. So in addition to this piece of DNA actually being deleted uh, in the population, it turns out that in about 20% of Caucasians, 
this particular region of the genome is actually turned around. It's what we call an inversion. So if the genes A, B, and C are indicated here, the same exact region that is deleted is actually opposite in about 20% of Caucasian individuals and in fact is CBA in this particular position. And so just to give you an orientation of this, this is actually the frequency of the inversion in the human population based on a, a survey of roughly 1,200 individuals from 50 different populations. The black bar or the black part of the pie chart indicates the proportion of individuals who carry the inversion. So you can, everybody can probably find where they approximately fit on this uh, world map. But the important thing to notice is that once you get outside of really Western Europe and, into, and, Medi and really in areas of Mediterranean, you get out into the East, particularly in Asia, in Africa, or in Amerindian populations, and these are all native populations, I should emphasize, essentially that inversion is completely absent. So this is an inversion that is represented about 20% of people from European countries. And what's remarkable about this inversion and this came from the, the investigators from Iceland that studied this inversion and they had access to a lot of genealogical data and a lot of uh, socialized medical records is people who carry the inversion tend to have more children than people who don't. It might sound strange and we don't know the genetic basis for it but it was used to argue that the inversion was somehow selectively advantageous and so it arose in an ancestral population and in, has increased in frequency in European populations supposedly, because of this advantage it confers upon fecundity. So when we looked back to the literature and saw this, and we saw the exact same region being deleted in kids, we asked, I think, what would be the obvious question, are children that are being born with the microdeletion, are they coming from parents who carry the inversion? And so we've tested now 17 parents of children who have the microdeletion, and every one of them come from the parent and the chromosome which carries the inversion. So this is very strong evidence, it's highly significant, that the inversion or something on that genetic background is predisposing that allele or that specific segment to, to delete. So the inversion polymorphism is there then a risk for a microdeletion event and it's a kind of an interesting corollary, which we don't know the answer to yet, but one hypothesis would be, is if the inversion is enriched and selectively advantageous in Caucasian populations, it would then follow that if the inversion is predisposing to the deletion event, that essentially this must be or may be a Caucasian-specific disease, not a worldwide disease. So it's not just having the duplications, it's the having the duplications at the edges and the inversion which is predisposing to disease. And so this is very preliminary data. We haven't published this yet. We've just had the opportunity to test another uh, 490 children for the presence of the microdeletion. These are children of, of African-American uh, ancestry from South Carolina. And we did not find in that group a single occurrence of the 17Q21 uh, microdeletion. Of course, this isn't the perfect experiment because there is Caucasian admixture in African-Americans but at least is suggestive that this may be a disease that's restricted to Caucasian populations. So what's cool about this is we have a yin for the yang, right? We have on one side an inversion which may be in fact beneficial in terms of, of populations. It may have had some kind of a selective effect to have more children, but that the kind of the bad part of it is that it may in fact be detrimental in predisposing at a very rare, a low frequency to microdeletion event. So I'll just uh, wrap up with a few other examples. We didn't set out to discover one disease. We, just set, it, we set out to, just, to characterize all regions of the genome that had this kind of signature. And so here's another example. I'm not going to go through the whole logic once again, um, but suffice it to say that um, this is another region of the genome where we found multiple children that had deletions corresponding to duplicated sequences in which their mother and father did not have that sequence deleted. Um, in this particular case, this is a novel deletion seen in, in children, um, but not in parentals. It is associated with mental retard retardation on chromosome 15Q24. We've now tested 3,000 normal individuals and never seen occurrence of this deletion once. So we found uh, four individuals. Not all of them have exactly the same breakpoint, but in this particular example, two of them do. This one actually has duplicated sequences at its boundary that is in fact common between breakpoint one, two, and three. This is what those children look like. Once again, you'll see similarity in the phenotype or in the, in the physical appearances, 
They have mild developmental delay. Com some common facial features, particularly the high anterior hairline, we call frontal bossing of the forehead, um, pronounced uh, ears, and, and really spa uh, large spacing between, between the eyes. Also noted has been joint laxity, loose connective tissue, and actually retardation in terms of growth. So these children tend to be relatively small in terms of stature. Here's another region, chromosome 15Q13.3. It's positioned right there. In this particular case, we found six unrelated patients which have the same microdeletion. So it's between these blocks of duplicated sequences. And this is one initially where we, in fact, excluded it because we found one of our parents actually had the microdeletion. So it didn't pass one of those litmus tests that the parent should be normal and should not have the deletion event. So why do we believe that it's a causative event now? Well, working with clinicians, we've had a chance to go back to those p families once again. And in, in the two examples where we actually have transmission in the family, it turns out that the, the parent from which the deletion came is also mildly handicapped. So this is an interesting problem. These, these people recognize it often as described as autistic. These are transmissions that are occurring in families. So here's an example of a family in which the mother was thought not to be handicapped, in which we found the deletion in two of her daughters. When we went back to the mother, the clinicians went back, it turned out that she had mild mental retardation as well. So in the two examples where we had transmission, in both cases, the parent of origin actually had mental handicap. And here are two of the children that we've identified that essentially have de novo events in which the parents are normal, but the deletion is associated with the microdeletion syndrome. So we've now identified six out of 2,082 individuals with mental retardation that we've tested, and zero out of, two, of roughly 3,000 controls that we've tested. Obviously, there's more work to be done, but it's suggestive. Uh, one interesting thing about this particular disease, in seven out of the nine individuals that we've looked at, six independent occurrences, but two within families, seven out of the nine individuals also have epilepsy slash seizures. So it may be that there's a gene important in epilepsy mapping specifically to this region. And finally, I want to leave you with this deletion syndrome. This comes from, a, from initially from children which do not have mental retardation. This is the work of a postdoc in my lab named Heather Mefford. And when she, she basically looked at children which were normal in terms of cognitive ability, but which had severe renal disease. So these are actually pictures of very abnormal kidneys. This is not how a kidney should look. Um, you have many uh, kind of multidysplastic, you have lots of uh, cysts forming on the particular kidneys here. In these children there was no evidence of mental retardation. The children were in some cases diagnosed with renal disease at usually a very early age of life. And in some cases the kids, kids weren't identified with renal disease as the primary diagnosis but were diagnosed with diabetes in their 20s and upon looking back at those individuals, they would see that there was actually defects in their, in their kidney structure. So in this particular case, and I'm showing you here three families, there's the mom and there's the dad. Here's their array comparative genomic hybridization again. Here's the affected child in each of these families. And in each one of these, we have a spontaneous deletion of about 600,000 base pairs of sequence. In this particular case, we actually know the disease gene. It's a disease gene known here as TCF2. And that's because we found point mutations, or our colleagues have found point mutations that are associated with kidney disease at that specific locus. So in summary, we found a lot of other regions of the genome, which I'm not going to share you, bore you with or share it with you, I guess, um, other than to say that we have a lot of candidate regions. But the examples I showed you today were examples that we found in the last year that we fairly feel fairly confident actually associate with disease. Diseases ranging from mental retardation to epilepsy to renal disease slash diabetes. So in terms of our study of children with idiopathic mental retardation, if all of the sites that we've identified that we don't see in the normal individuals and are, are de novo are true, we may have explained another 5 to 6% of mental retardation, at least the genetic basis of it. If we're conservative and we just talk about the three syndromes that I described today, it's about half of that number. And so recognize that essentially mental retardation affects what's estimated between 1 in 50 births, 1 in 100 births. I think this is a pretty significant yield on having a genome sequence at our disposal 
essentially for analyzing uh, diseases in the human population. So we have a very unstable genome. Our genome changes a lot more, I think, than many people would have appreciated. The duplication architecture predisposes specific regions of the genome to delete and duplicate at a much higher frequency. And while each individual site is rare, and it's happening at only maybe 1 in 10,000, 1 in 2,000, 1 in 100,000 sperm or egg are being produced, collectively they may contribute to a large fraction of disease in our population. So I think it's important to think about the fact that individuals are not just the sum of their parents, but they are more or less the sum of their parents based on this property. And what's particularly interesting is that when you look at other species, such as mice, such as rats, such as dogs, they do not have this architecture. So we now know that at least, at least in the species that we've examined, and we don't have a complete repertoire of genomes at our disposal yet, that this interspersed or dispersed architecture of duplications, which is predisposing to these events, is relatively restricted to humans, great apes, and perhaps uh, old world monkey species. And just so you don't feel completely safe, we've performed some surveys of normal individuals, quote unquote, uh, for these regions, and we find that about 10% of normal individuals, uh, people in this room, are actually missing large sections of their DNA or have duplicated large sections of their DNA, suggesting that we may be now predisposed to different diseases, maybe diseases that manifest themselves as physical differences between people, or maybe manifest, manifest themselves later on in life as a different type of disease. So one question you might ask yourself is if we have such an unstable genome, and we have all these regions of the genome that are deleting and duplicating, why do we have it? Why has it evolved in our species at all, if it creates such havoc? So I think the example from 17Q21 is instructive. But remember this, that when you have additional copies of sequences within a genome, this is kind of old theory that goes back now 30 or 40 years, you essentially allow the opportunity to create new genes in, your, in, our, in a species that is evolving. So duplication is the primary way in which new genes and gene families arise within species. And the way it occurs is that you in those dark areas of the genome, you duplicate an extra copy of an old gene. The old gene can still do what it normally does in the organism. But this new gene can undergo mutations and sometimes, rarely, but sometimes acquire a new function. So although most of the time it dies, an ignoble death, and becomes detritus in the genome, occasionally mutations can occur and lead to a new function. So in these bad regions of the genome, is there any evidence for new genes and gene families? So the answer is yes, and I don't have time to talk to you about these other areas or this other aspect of, of our genome, but there are good things that happen in these specific regions of the genome. And the good things are the birth of new genes and gene families. And so in the last few years, there's been about a half a dozen genes and gene families that have been described. These gene families are very interesting. They don't have homology, or they don't share any similarity to genes that are found in a dog or a rat or a cat. They seem to be very primate-specific genes. The evolutionary signatures tell us that these genes have actually changed very quickly and are actually under selection, what we call positive selection, for change. And the, the data on the available genes suggest that their expression patterns have changed wildly over very short periods of time. And that different, closely related species, such as a chimp and a human, have very different copies of these great ape human-specific gene families. So the function of these, unfortunately, in the, for the most part, is largely unknown. But there's not a lot of them. And almost all of them are associated with these regions that are spontaneously resulting in deletion and duplication in our children with disease. So maybe the benefit of having these extra deletions, or uh, the benefit of actually having these additional genes or these new genes uh, is slightly outweighs the detriment of actually having disease in our population spontaneously occurring de de uh, deletions and duplications as a result of these. So in conclusion, I've talked about hot spots of the genome, um, that there's a particular architecture in our genome that pr promotes recurrent deletion and duplication events. Most of the events that we've described so far have been associated with deletions and not the reciprocal, the duplications. So we do know those exist in people. We do find for almost every one of our events, we do find duplications. But, the, but the, the manifestation in terms of disease is not as clear. 
Our targeted approach discovered three new microdeletion syndromes associated with mental retardation and another that's associated, we believe, with diabetes and renal disease. It may explain 5 to 6% of mental retardation and congenital birth defects. And I think there's a need, now that we have a genome sequence and we know where these regions are, to do large-scale screens of children with pediatric disease, specific congenital ab abnormalities, specifically mental retardation, specifically autism. Because by doing so, we may in fact discover the genetic basis for things that aren't actually inherited. And as I mentioned, there's both positive and negative effects for these during human evolution. So in closing, there is no perfect genome. All of us are essentially missing probably large sections of genetic material as well as small sections or have gained extra copies. I would argue that having genome sequence from one human or one composite of humans is not enough. And there's an, a big effort at NIH that will probably be, la be launched and described in the next few months, which will describe an effort to sequence another thousand genomes over the next couple years. I think an important thing for geneticists, particularly to think about, is everything that's genetic may not be inherited. And I think a lot of us, having grown up in the field of genetics, we think that important diseases are going to be inherited. And this, uh, these and other data from other groups are suggesting that, in fact, de novo events may be as important in terms of human disease. And in terms of evolutionary impact, you often hear, the, I think, the quote that chimpanzee and human are about 99% identical in terms of their genetic code. So when people are talking about that, what they're referring to are those single base pair changes. So there's about 35 million differences between a chimp and a human. But when you actually look at these specific regions of the genome, they are actually much more different than your average areas of, the, of, of genetic sequence. So in essence, the human and chimp are closest related species is in, in fact more genetically different with respect to duplications and deletions over these specific areas of the genome. And if there are genes in these regions that are essentially important in terms of human and chimpanzee and gorilla evolution, perhaps these are the genes that we should be looking at in terms of human adaptation. But that is completely speculation at this point. So <laughs> I don't want to leave you with that but is there anything factual there. So in close, I would like to really thank two people uh, in my lab, particularly that did most of the work that I presented today. Andy Sharp, who was a postdoc that's now moved on to Geneva, and Heather Mefford, who's a clinical fellow, who's done a lot of the work, particularly with respect to diabetes. Great colleagues in Italy, um, particularly uh, at UCSF, Dan Pinkle, who helped us to develop the array comparative genomic hybridization platform. I know it's a mouthful. Um, uh, we also refer to it as a Ray CGH in the lab. And also great colleagues really across the world, particularly in Europe and here in the States, that provided us access to clinical samples and allowed us to go back to families wherever it was possible. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.